next speaker is Professor Michael Hoffman. He is a nuclear medicine physician and director of the Prostate Cancer Theranostics and Imaging Centre of Excellence at the Peter Max Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here and present a little bit of the research that we do at uh, Peter Mac and an honour to be elected a member of the society. So today I'm going to dive into uh, Theranostics, which is something that some people in the, this audience might not know I, uh, a lot about. It's a word that encompasses both uh, Theranost uh, therapy and diagnostics, and we use radioactive molecules, which can do both. Uh, both imaging with a PET scanner and then uh, treatment. Uh, when I speak to lay people, they think this is a really new technology, but in fact, it's been around for a very long time and maybe is the first targeted treatment in modern oncology. Uh, this is Saul Hertz. He was a endocrinologist who was studying a thyroid hormone manufacture at the time. And uh, he realized that iodine that you consume uh, is taken up by the thyroid gland and that it's the only organ in the body that uses iodine. And he happened to be working at MGH where the first medical cyclotron uh, was installed. And he asked the question whether iodine could be made radioactive. He knew then he may be able to treat uh, thyroid conditions. And in fact, he did just that. He treated the first patients both for benign conditions like hyperthyroidism with radioactive iodine and also metastatic uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, so back then, he was not able to image the iodine. He was just able to administer it in a therapeutic form. PET scanners and SPECT scanners didn't exist back then. So he could use some external gamma counters to sort of measure the uptake in the thyroid, but he couldn't get these types of fancy images that we can do today. So now we can administer iodine in the form of I124, which is a positron emitter, and we can image it. This is a patient with metastatic uh, thyroid cancer, and we can see these lymph node metastases in the mediastinum. And these are very small. they less than one millimeter in size. In fact, we can barely see them on the CT, even when we know where to look, yet the uptake is extraordinary. Uh, those familiar with PET scanning, I can see Danny in the audience, uh, will note the SUV max of uh, 430, which is really high for disease that's this tiny. Uh, so this is actually the best tracer that we have in nuclear medicine, even though it's uh, just over 80 years old. We haven't found a tracer which has higher tumor to background uh, uptake. Uh, so here we're imaging uh, thyroid cancer, and then we can change from I124, which is the positron emitter, to I131, which is a beta emitter, exactly the same molecule, uh, just in a different isomer, so emitting a different type of radioactivity. And the I131 emits beta radiation that travels only one millimeter and has very high energy that will damage double-stranded DNA and lead to uh, cell death. And after a single dose of radioactive iodine, this patient with bone metastases uh, is cured. And this is something that we've been able to do since the uh, 1930s. And when we think about solid organ malignancies that have metastasized to bone or lung uh, that we can cure, uh, there still aren't too many even today. Uh, so Theranostics is this concept where we're using a diagnostic radionuclide for imaging, typically now on a PET scanner, and then a therapeutic radionuclide for uh, treatment. And there's a few different types of radioactivities that we can use on the treatment side, OJ, alpha, and beta electrons. Uh, my area of research in the last decade has been in uh, prostate cancer using small molecules that bind to uh, this receptor called prostate-specific membrane antigen, or PSMA, that sits on the cell surface of prostate cancer. Uh, the first <clears throat> uh, of these studies was done by German groups in 2012. On the left, you can see a mouse model uh, of prostate cancer. And that same group did the first in-human imaging one year later in 2013. And you can see very high uptake in this tiny presacral node uh, in a patient with prostate cancer. And one year later in Peter Mac, we did our first PSMA PET scan. Although it's worth noting since we're here in Brisbane that actually the first PSMA PET was actually done here in Brisbane about three weeks before us at uh, Peter Mac. Uh, so this is patient number one. Uh, he had prostate cancer, a Gleason score four plus five, so a high grade, high risk prostate cancer. And his conventional imaging was normal, CT, MRI, bone scanning, 
So he was scheduled to undergo a prostatectomy with the intent to cure him. But when we did the PSMA PET CT, we could see a lymph node metastasis in the pelvis and also a bone metastasis. And it was pretty clear that a prostatectomy was not going to cure him. Uh, we'd also learned in nuclear medicine over years that these types of pretty pictures, although striking and sort of an N equals one and almost definitive, uh, don't change global practice uh, and that we need to do sort of some randomized control trials uh, to really get these new technologies adopted. So when I saw first saw these pictures, uh, I helped design a Australia-wide multi-center randomized trial called the uh, Pro-PSMA trial, which was funded through Movember. This was an investigator-initiated trial. It ran at, at 10 sites in all states around Australia, and we randomized 300 men with newly diagnosed prostate cancer who were scheduled to undergo a prostatectomy or curative intent radiotherapy to either this new PSMA PET-CT or the standard of care at the time, which, which was a CT and a bone scan. And we showed superior accuracy, 92% compared to 65, a greater management change, fewer uncertain results. This is really important because often when you order a scan, you get back an equivocal finding that needs another test. Uh, and in fact, almost one in four CT bone scans had an equivocal finding compared to only 7% of uh, PSMA PET scans. Uh, this was published in The Lancet in uh, 2020, and it's really led to global adoption of this new technology. It's been very rewarding. When we did those first PET scans 10 years ago, uh, it was available in Brisbane, Peter Mac, probably for only two years, there was no one else in Australia doing these PET scans. And now, thanks to sort of some high-level evidence and MBS reimbursement, this is available right around Australia in more than 60 PET scanners around Australia. Australia, you can now get a funded uh, PSMA PET scan. And as part of that, we uh, brought together this group of really amazing uh, nuclear medicine doctors working together with medical oncology, radiation oncology, urology, and our clinical trial staff. And this network has continued to grow and contributed to around five or six multi-center studies that are currently underway today. So changing tracks from imaging, uh, we can use that same target, PSMA, to treat patients with metastatic prostate cancer. We take really the same molecule, and instead of labeling it to a positron emitter, we label it to lutetium-177. Now, lutetium-177 is a beta emitter. It actually has very similar properties to I131, iodine-131, but it being a radiometal, we can label it to these small molecules uh, quite tightly. It has a path length of one millimeter and a half-life of seven days. So we essentially give it as an injection into a vein. It finds its way around the body, binds to the prostate cancer cells and uh, emits high energy radiation with that very short path length, meaning that prostate cancer cells are eradicated, but there's not much effect on surrounding normal tissues. And with a seven day half-life, uh, the treatment uh, continues to work for as much as three to four weeks after a single uh, dose of treatment. Uh, this is an animation uh, that a group that the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia put together uh, for one of our trials to uh, show patients how the treatment's working. Here we can see that small molecule binding to the uh, receptor and emitting uh, these beta rays. And we can also image uh, the radiation on a conventional nuclear medicine camera since it also emits a small amount of gamma. And then we can see the spread of prostate cancer and the uptake of tumors. We're very lucky in Australia to have uh, ANSTO, which is a research nuclear reactor uh, near Lucas Heights, where our lutetium-177 is uh, manufactured on a weekly basis. There's only around four or five sites around the world uh, where lutetium-177 is manufactured. Uh, so this sort of infrastructure and facility uh, is one of the keys to our uh, success. And we went on in Australia to do the first uh, prospective trial of this uh, new treatment in prostate cancer. And to start with, we took men who had failed all treatment options who are really you know, being transferred to palliative care. And we offered them a treatment of lutetium PSMA 617. And we saw some really unprecedented response rates. Uh, this is a graph of sort of the PSA drop in 50 patients and 64% of patients had a halving of their PSA. Uh, if we consider this was in a sort of last line setting, even one treatment line before lutetium would have a response rate of maybe 20 to 30%. Uh, 
So when we were seeing response rates of 64%, uh, we knew this was uh, potentially practice changing. Uh, this is a image showing the PSMA PET scans before and after treatment in uh, eight of the men on the trial. And in red is the prostate cancer. And we can see uh, that many of these men had very extensive disease, uh, typically with bone metastases. And they were very symptomatic, often with uh, severe pain uh, on opiate analgesics. And really after the first dose of this treatment, men would come back within 24 hours describing that their pain had improved and we saw some uh, remarkable uh, responses. We then went on to do a large Australian randomized control trial. This was through the uh, ANZUP, a cooperative trials group, where we randomized 200 men around Australia to either lutetium PSMA treatment or a second line chemotherapy called carbazitaxel and uh, results published in the Lancet. And we showed that there was twice the response rate with lutetium 66% uh, compared to 37% for carbazitaxel, and this translated to improved progression-free survival. So that by one year, almost everyone who had chemotherapy had disease progression, whereas around 20% of men who had uh, lutetium PSMA had no progression at uh, 12 months. And the tumor shrinkage on CT by resist criteria was double, 50% uh, compared to 24%. Uh, but even just as important was patient reported outcomes or quality of life. And this favored the lutetium PSMA over the chemotherapy, despite having sort of twice the level of activities. And this is a feature of this treatment is that it's just really well tolerated. Uh, men don't get much in the way of side effects. Uh, it's a very targeted form of really precision oncology. It's important to note that we don't treat everyone. We can select patients quite carefully for this treatment using PET scans. And we've been using two PET scans in this trial, a PSMA PET and an FDG PET. FDG is our sort of bread and butter radioactive sugar scan. And in this patient, we can see that despite having quite a lot of metastatic prostate cancer with PSMA expression on the left, there's also a lot of disease in the middle that's not expressing the PSMA. So this is tumor heterogeneity. And we can predict up front that this is not a patient that's likely to benefit too much from the radioactive treatment since we can't target uh, all the disease. And in the clinical trials, we've excluded these patients uh, up front and offered them other treatments that may be more effective. Uh, thanks to this body of research, we established a center of excellence at Peter Mac focused on uh, PSMA imaging and therapy research with three main aims. One, to increase the number of clinical trials. Two, to do some discovery research of new uh, ligands, some deep learning. Uh, liquid biomarkers, and three, uh, providing some uh, leadership and education about how to best implement this new form of treatment. Uh, we now offer this treatment uh, both on and off clinical trials. And here you can see the quite rapid growth of this program just at Peter Mac, and this is mirrored in multiple centers now around Australia uh, from 2015, where we did the first treatment, uh, to last year, where we did almost uh, 600 of these therapies. We're lucky to have a, a dedicated Theranostics treatment facility at Peter Mac. Being a radioactive treatment, there are some nuances to giving this treatment. Patients are radioactive for a short period afterwards. Uh, so we need uh, some shielded uh, rooms and some dedicated uh, bathrooms and other facilities. And another nuance of this treatment is that uh, the radioactive substances are actually made in the hospital. We get the radioactive lutetium from ANSTO, uh, we get the peptides, uh, from Germany, and then we compound them uh, in-house in specialized facilities, and then that's administered to the patient. And on the right, you can also see uh, one of our small animal PET scanners at Peter Mac, where we can do some uh, translational research. We now have more than 10 uh, investigator-initiated uh, trials of PSMA uh, running all around Australia. Uh, we've tried to take this treatment now from our very last line of treatment to an earlier line of treatment and also combine it with other treatments such as immunotherapy or chemotherapy or other forms of uh, radiosensitizers. Uh, we're also looking at uh, newer radioactive uh, particles that may be even more uh, suited to eradicating small volume disease, the microscopic disease, uh, than the lutetium. So I'd just like to highlight one of these trials, and we're lucky in nuclear medicine to have sort of half the periodic table to play with. And here it's just you can see in different colors uh, which of these 
elements you can use for PET spec beta therapy, OJ therapy, or uh, beta therapy. It's quite remarkable. And we've been focused on uh, terbium 161, which is a dual beta OJ emitter. So this emits beta particles that are quite similar to the lutetium, the particles that travel about one millimeter, but they also emit another particle called an OJ electron. Uh, these electrons travel only a very short distance, actually less than the width of a single cell, but they have an energy about a thousand fold greater than lutetium. And we think one of the problems with lutetium whereby patients eventually progress is that we don't get rid of very small clusters of uh, tumor cells. Uh, so we're currently running a, a first in human trial of terbium 161 PSMA at PETAMAC. I think we've treat, treated patient number 18 uh, this week. Uh, just before I finish, highlight some of the uh, knowledge translation uh, research we do. Uh, when we when the pro-PSMA study was published in the Lancet, COVID just broke out and we were due to uh, present that research at the European Urology meeting, but the world had shut down and uh, uh, none of us could fly to Europe to present that, uh, which was a little bit of a shame uh, because it was co-timed with the Lancet publication, which was the first for me. Uh, so instead... Uh, we did a podcast together with our urology colleagues, Declan Murphy, who leads our urology service, who's really into uh, social media. And that's grown to become a, a, a podcast called GU Cast uh, with many, many episodes uh, focused on nuclear medicine. And I think uh, having these new ways to disseminate our information on YouTube and podcasting has become an important element of our uh, program as well, because it seems no one gets journals in the mail anymore and sort of reads them from uh, front to back. So with that, I'd like to thanks for the thanks everyone for the opportunity to present our research today. Uh, thank the team at uh, Peter Mac that make this work possible. It's a real big uh, team effort. One of the great things about nuclear medicine is that we work with radiochemists, uh, medical physicists, nuclear medicine technologists uh, to make all this happen. Uh, thank everyone else in the oncology team at Peter Mac and all our funding partners. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. I just have a question about the whole area of theranostics and the comparability between different agents. As you know, you know we don't do another 30,000 person randomized study every time we get another statin. But it seems that there's a lot of um, debate in this area around equivalence of different theranostics. Do you, do you want to just comment on how you would assess that or how you see that um, issue? Yeah, so this is an interesting area since we can image what we're treating. And uh, after we administer a treatment, when we put a patient on our SPECT camera, we can then quantify the amount of uptake in tumor and normal tissues in gray, uh, a bit like external beam radiation. So when we get a new agent, do we want to do another big randomized control trial to compare one agent to the other? Or do we want to merely show that uh, the amount of radiation we can deliver to tumors is similar? and that we're not giving more to normal organs. And it's topical with lutetium PSMA in particular, uh, since there is a MSAC assessment underway at the moment in Australia for funding of this treatment. And there's a generic version of it that's much cheaper than the IP protected version from a you know, commercial uh, uh, big pharma company. And the application in Australia has actually come from the Association of Nuclear Medicine Specialists as an academic specialist, uh, academic application for the non-patented version. And uh, as we submitted that to government, not me, but rather the AANMS, uh, they took the evidence from the patented compound and said, look, this generic equivalent is the same. And we know this based on basic uh, biology and our measurements. And in fact, the government or MSAC committee that's evaluated it, has accepted that evidence base and said, yes, we accept that this is equivalent. We accept that no one's going to do a $50 million trial to show that the cheaper drug is as good as the more expensive drug. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting area. Uh, that MSAC assessment, I don't know if there's anyone involved here in that, in the audience, but it's uh, I think it's in its third round. So we are hoping that this treatment will be uh, will be funded. And it's an interesting funding model because we're asked for sort of a hospital-based radiopharmaceutical production model that's actually quite cheap uh, and uh, keeps nuclear medicine alive and uh, enriches our hospital with radiochemistry. There's a lot of 
positive flow on effects and also to ANSTO that make our uh, lutetium 177 in Australia. Yeah, fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't catch what proportion of advanced prostate cancers was the P PSMA uh, antigen binding to and what happens on the off target? How, how sensitive and specific is the actual therapy? Yeah, thanks for the question. So in the therapy trial, the Australian randomized trial, around 70% of the patients screened were suitable after imaging uh, and went on to have be randomized either to chemotherapy or lutetium. And we followed up the 30% that we didn't randomize uh, and they did quite poorly. They had more aggressive disease, tumor heterogeneity, uh, their survival was poorer. And the second question, the specificity. Look, it's actually very specific. Uh, so when we see this for imaging, uh, it's very, very specific for prostate cancer. There's a few other tumors that also express uh, PSMA, but it tends not to be on the cell surface, uh, but in tumor microvasculature. Uh, so when we do the scan, we don't see much background activity, but we see uptake in salivary glands and kidneys as the off-target organs. Uh, so for example, it can be useful for imaging some rare tumors like metastatic salivary gland tumors, uh, but it's probably not so useful for treating those tumors uh, because the activity washes out over time, whereas in prostate cancer, it binds to that receptor and sort of sticks to the tumor.